Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week, or today, is Canella Michelle Myers from North Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. So welcome, Michelle. Well, thank you, Rick. It's good to be here with you this morning. Yeah. Um, so Michelle and I were talking a little bit. Oh, Canella. You go by Canella, really. Not either, Michelle. either one works. Canella, oh, okay. Michelle is you don't care? Name, so, no. Okay. Um, we were talking uh, before the interview about what we were going to talk about, and uh, we we thought we'd have, give you a whole sort of overview of both, um, you know, Canella's personal life story, particularly as it pertains to spiritual awakening, and then you know an expression of what it is she likes to express in terms of knowledge, which some teachers exclusively like to do one or the other. Uh, but I, I think having listened to Michelle quite a bit in preparation for this interview, I find that she's comfortable with a wide range of expressions, and so we'll r run the whole gamut. <laughs> so where would you like to start? Oh, I don't know. How about a question? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's like, you know, from the vastness, pick something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's helpful. So I would say... Uh, I mean, most of us, you're younger than I am. I grew up in the 60s and kind of got onto kind of spirituality in the late 60s and, you know, through various chemical assists. And uh, then after about a year of that, got sick of it and, and learned to meditate and turned to more natural sources of spirituality. And I, I, even though you're a slightly different generation, I, I have a feeling that your background is somewhat similar, you know, of a fair amount of experimentation and bumbling and, and uh, eventually coming into a much greater sort of clarity of purpose. Um, yes and no. I mean, the, the experimentation as far as, um, um, you know, with marijuana or, or hash, um, I hadn't actually explored anything more than that. Um, but it, it kind of came to a standstill after that experience when I was 15. So oh, I, yeah, didn't actually, yeah. I didn't actually go into any more of that because I was um, terrified of the same thing happening. <laughs> yeah, tell us about that. That was quite an experience. Yeah, well, apparently a, a joint that myself and my girlfriend smoked uh, was laced with um, MDA or, or um, huh. LSD. I mean, that's what a doctor guessed because we were having where I was having flashbacks while I was on a trip to Disneyland with my mom and dad. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in one way it was good that it, it started out of necessity. I, I had to tell my mom and dad because I was scared and I didn't know what was happening and why I was having this uh, incredible experience um, that I was attempting so strongly to stop that, of course, it was horribly um, uncomfortable and... Uh, not fun whatsoever um, and it was this doctor that happened to be on the bus tour to Disneyland that my parents approached uh, who said you know there's nothing you can do with a flashback you need to just open open to this because this might be the way that your life is and what was the experience exactly um, um, if my eyes were closed I could see more than what I was seeing with my eyes open. I could see people talking and voices, all sorts of um, information that I couldn't shut off. Hallucinatory uh, or things that were actually happening around you? Oh no, um, things that were hindsight. It, I believe it was stuff that I was ha that was actually happening, but not present in that room. Right. I was picking up on psychic information. Mm -hmm. um, this that part of me had just like totally whacked open yeah um, and so when my well, I did my have my eyes open and my parents came toward me they'd be all stretched out sideways and mm. speaking in slow motion um, mm. you know like this and, wow. and it was um, and of course I was trying to stop it with every ounce of, mm -hmm. of, of my 15 year old self um, until this doctor spoke with me and said this might be it you need to open to it and huh. uh, what a blessing you know um, because that's exactly what I did I just just relaxed I, I bit by bit I allowed myself to relax open and uh, 
so it didn't actually stop it's more like I got used to um, living with that part of myself open but it because of the fear wasn't there and the contraction and the resistance mm -hmm. to it it um, softened and mm. um, the only time that it would kind of break open to a place where it was uncomfortable was sometimes in crowds in a mall or something like mm. that and then I would just breathe and open to it and uh, be all right. So did it go on for weeks and months and years or did it eventually just stop? Um, it, well once I'd softened open, I, it wasn't really, it was so gradual. Um, I don't know that it really stopped. Mm -hmm. um, it, I, it just became integrated integrated and normal yeah. so huh. um, do you still have anything like that to this day well uh, in terms of picking up stuff that's from afar and so on oh absolutely uh -huh. um, th that but it's now it's a it's a support like um, right I was in uh, Costa Rica and woke up one morning and I you know I didn't know I was just on this beach where some women had been kidnapped Mm. And I was just in that, you know, morning time of not quite awake and musing and just kind of wondering, wow, what, what it must be like for them to be kidnapped, these women, what would they be experiencing? And just out of the blue, I, I saw a word across whatever it was, however it was I was seeing, it was said Belém. Mm. And then I could see these women and they were in a hut with... Um, a dirt floor and chickens were walking around and stuff and uh, I didn't really think anything of it until we packed up the van and were headed back down the road um, and uh, the next town that we came through was Belém hmm. and I didn't even know and so the whole thing then I realized whoa this was real I was what I was seeing was real so I ended up actually contacting some uh, uh, a notary that said English spoken mm -hmm. And just thought, okay, I'll just give a statement, and if this person can send it to the family of these women that had been kidnapped, you know, who am I, some Canadian woman who has this vision, and who knows what it means? But if I was their parents, I would still want to know of anything. Yeah. If because uh, they, you know, had been missing for quite a while, mm -hmm. and so the notary actually um, contacted the police. Um, while we were there, didn't really tell us, kind of kept us, kept keeping us there through just saying, oh, hold on, hold on, you know, like telling us some sort of story. But uh, pretty soon some detectives came from uh, San Jose and um, I started actually working as a, a psychic, I guess, for them. Um, and then they found some house in... in uh, Belém? Uh, in that area mm -hmm. that um, they had some suspicious some suspicions about and um, I did hear later that they had found them. Oh, I'll be darned. So, did you but, just work on that particular case or did you start working on other cases as a psychic? Um, no, just that particular case and mm -hmm. then it kind of came up a couple other times with other people um, if it came within a Reiki session or out of the blue when a um, a woman was was missing um, but I never pursued it as an offering right to say you know this is something that you can find here with this canela it was yeah. just it's just if it happened right that's where it would go so when you were 15 how long did it take you to sort of kind of realize that hey this is kind of cool actually and and maybe there's there's some silver lining to this <laughs> shift that I've undergone oh I uh, didn't really look at that like that. I mean, I definitely stayed away from drugs. Yeah, I mean, that yeah. was the the good side effect, I think, because a lot of um, friends continued on with explorations, and some of them mm -hmm. got to some really tough spots um, that I yeah. didn't. I didn't, you know, because I didn't end up even belonging to the group anymore because I wasn't participating. Um, you know. Yeah. So but it, you you did allude to uh, before the we started the recording you alluded to alcohol or something was it some significance of alcohol uh, in yeah, your life that was that was much later yeah oh <laughs> that, okay that um, so you know alcoholism is something that or say an unhealthy relationship with alcohol mm -hmm. um, is on both sides of my parents families and mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's it's part of you know this ancestry 
Um, yeah. But I never really thought of myself as being an alcoholic or, mm -hmm. you know, having that term applied yeah. to myself. But as I started to meditate, um, and after I started practicing Reiki and, and uh, life shifted so much from realizing I didn't need to fight, um, I started looking at things more closely and I started looking at my own relationship and noticing that whenever with my own relationship with, with alcohol. So mm -hmm. at, at the time, what I noticed is that whenever anybody offered me alcohol, I was always yes. Mm -hmm. um, and if I had a drink, there was something in me that thought I would have an even better time if I drank more, mm. right? And, it, and it, it wasn't working because the next morning I'd feel horrible. Yeah, right. No, not that I drank a lot. It's just like sharing a, a bottle of wine with my, mm -hmm. my husband at the time or... Um, all I knew is that when I looked directly at it, that alcohol was something more than juice, water, tea, or coffee, right? It, it, was, it, it held something more for me, and, and I saw that that wasn't healthy. Yeah. So in my own honesty with myself, I decided, okay, I'm going to uh, stop drinking to see what this is. Um, and so what happened was I, I abstained from drinking. Um, but yet the urge was still there. Mm -hmm. So I would sit, whenever the urge came up, I would sit with how I felt uh, and feel the energy inside myself that was kind of longing or believing that there was some sort of magic in alcohol that was going to be good for me somehow. And um, I would just sit with those thoughts and feelings, the sensations in the body, until they uh, eventually they disappeared. Um, and then came a time when someone offered me some wine mm -hmm. and I knew in that moment fear actually rose hmm. because once I had found and, and released myself from the power I had given alcohol see I I had learned that giving over power um, as if alcohol held something more than anything else um, so I met that and and basically took the power I gave alcohol back to myself mm -hmm. um, and then in that moment when somebody said well would you like a glass of wine and fear rose I realized well I could give alcohol that power again if I started to fear it mm. um, so I, I said okay well just give me just an inch to see what will happen um, and so I breathing and, and I was afraid I didn't want to lose what I had gained I thought I might lose it again to alcohol mm -hmm. to this wine you know that it would all show up again somehow and uh, instead I just had that little bit and it was somewhat tasty it was okay um, but nothing happened mm -hmm. you know uh, awareness was softened right um, but it, there was no draw no pull the, the longing didn't show up again Mm. I've heard that uh, sort of thing advocated uh, for overcoming any kind of addiction, food or, um, you know, smoking yes. or any, anything else, just sort of tuning into, you know, what you're really feeling inside when you have that craving rather than just blindly succumbing to the temptation. Yeah. And it seems like mechanics of it are that it, it can actually root out the, the root cause of the of the addiction. Well, it's exactly. And then this is this is a sort of support that... Um, I offer people too anything that um, they feel that they're giving more power to, like money. Mm -hmm. um, we can work with it and see where it connects in and, and bring it up on purpose. To um, you know, and, and that can be with any kind of addiction. It can be an addiction of thoughts of the mind, right? Mm -hmm. Where that people focus in on a person in particular who is particularly uh, irritating or any kind of idea of blame that that person or power that person has power over over mm -hmm. themselves then we have something that we can work with and um, explore and see where it connects um, energetically mm. so in, in other words any sort of irritant or um, annoyance or whatever can be used as a tool to uh, Explore a, a a blind spot or a, a you know an area that hasn't been uh, explored or uncovered or or freed of obstruction. Is that what you're saying? Yes, I, I see them as invitations. Yeah, I, they're energy um, that mm -hmm. rises, and 
if it's uncomfortable, that means we're trying to get our own attention. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, people usually in the comfy experiences, they don't, uh, they come and go. Yeah. <laughs> and it's the uncomfortable ones that people try to move away from. Mm. Which is kind of a nice, I mean, everybody has this opportunity, obviously, because life is always presenting us with challenges of yes. all kinds. And so there's no um, shortage of uh, evolutionary possibilities. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have any ideas around um, people needing to be anything other than just a human being and mm -hmm. interested. If they're, as long as they're interested to look and see, I have found um, that people of all walks of life, whether they're interested in the spiritual search or just interested in enjoying their life more, um, that it, yeah, it has no prerequisite to explore these bits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but that's okay. Um, the uh, so I've I've listened to a number of your thought songs, and you sort of do that with people. They'll come up and sit with you, and then you'll kind of tune them into what what's going on now. You know, they'll, they'll go off on some flight of fancy, and you'll say, "Well, how, how about right now? What's going on?" And you know, kind of um, give them a taste of of you know being sort of uh, sensitive to uh, how one reacts to things and and you know what's actually going on inside when we feel this that or the other thing about someone or something yeah i, I actually i don't um i support them to find that. right right I, you're not actually, finding it for them obviously yeah i don't tune in really i'm i'm with them yeah and uh, so it's sort of like a joining with them Mm -hmm. um, there's a with, I call it withness, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like right now you and I have this connection that's with us right here, right now. Right. Um, so all I do is open to that connection mm -hmm. um, and see what rises, inclusive of what they're seeing, because I can't see what they're perceiving. Right. I can only feel the energy. Hmm. Well, that's significant. Um, I mean the average person might not feel the energy, you know, but what you're implying is that there's been some sort of opening in you that has enabled, that enables you to be more sensitive to the energy that someone else is emitting or going through, right? Well, it's in no separation. Right? In no yeah. separation, yeah. yeah. So this witness is no separation, so that is, awareness is aware of what actually is, so, um, and this system is particularly sensitive to energy and um, the felt sense of that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been, I don't know, explored extensively to, and therefore expanded on. Mm -hmm. um, like anything that you play with quite a bit, you get better and better. I mean, talk about my sons with video games. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, it's... Uh, so yeah, it's it's something that everybody is aware of in their own way. I might have a particular way of being with it, hearing the energies and very empathic uh, mm -hmm. system, my physicality. I can actually feel it in my body. Mm. Um, but everybody has their way of hearing what is. Yeah. Um, and that's what I love to support is people to recognize that they're actually with as soon as they see it, they can see that it's been right, right there with them. It's it's not. It's just that they're not looking quite in that direction. Yeah. It seems. So let's say you're sitting with somebody and they're feeling very fearful about something. Do you actually feel some like queasiness in your solar plexus or you know some such thing corresponding to the fear that they're experiencing? Yeah, it, it comes in different ways depending on the person. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's like just a. a real strong stillness in a particular area of the body mm -hmm. or um, sometimes the actual I feel the actual emotion in in so you'll see that in satsang that uh, tears can come as I let sadness or grieving mm. as I'm with somebody if it's particularly strong that they haven't allowed that um, I'll actually be with them mm -hmm. um, in the feeling of the grief um, and somehow that makes it easier for the person to open to yeah. these strong emotions or feelings. Hmm. That's interesting. 
I don't know if you've ever seen Ama, the Hugging Saint, but uh, yeah. it's, she's kind of interesting to watch because she'll sit there for you know ten hours at a time or something, and people are coming up and she's embracing each one, and it's like uh, there's kind of this infinite flexibility in terms of her adapt adapt adaption to each uh, each individual who comes up. You know, there'll be tears one minute, laughter the next. You know, yeah. um, oh, this it's like amazing. It's like Mark Twain said about the weather in Connecticut. If you don't like it, wait a few minutes. <laughs> but there's this <laughs> kind of infinite flexibility, sort of, of uh, <laughs> in responding to each person and going deep into the situation with each person. Yeah. And uplifting yeah. them and cl helping them to clear out whatever it is they're they're going through. Yeah, it's just being with. It's that we we feel so alone. You know, that's what the separateness. Mm -hmm. It 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 has a feeling as if you're alone when you know you nobody's really alone. <laughs> We're right. such an incredible mix of everything that's happening. <laughs> mm. um, but it's too open to that. It's also scary. People find that scary to really let in that. Um, you know that they are more of a gap than they are substance, and that mm. there there is no glue holding them together <laughs> as a human being. It's just happening that way. Huh. Um, you know, there's a magneticness and intelligence to the uh, molecules and atoms, uh, but there's no there's no glue. You know? hmm. Interesting. Well. <sighs> There is and there isn't. I mean, isn't there a sort of a level of our life which is, uh, you know, totally open and totally unbounded and ve use the word vast at the beginning of the interview. Um, and then at the same time, there's a sort of a, a structured level, a manifest level, which has its integrity. And, and um, even though science would tell us that if you look closely enough, it's mostly empty space. But there's a, there's a sort of, a, um, you know, an individuation that makes life possible. Or not? I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but is, is do you see it that way, or otherwise? Well, I know that there was a time when I did see it that way, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and that fell away mm -hmm. uh, with when I connected with Isaac that time, and I and I just, Isaac Shapiro. Yes, I just asked him, "Is it beyond perception?" Mm -hmm. And he said yes. And in that moment, the part that was sort of feeding the belief in um, as if I was something disappeared. It mm -hmm. just actually fell away. It seemed to be sort of around around me, mm -hmm. this structure, and it just disappeared. It completely left. And so there is actually a, a, a when I look, there's a direct experience of space and something here in space mm -hmm. right now, right? And same as the computer. Um, same as the air between, you know, what appears to be here and the computer screen and, and the sound that's happening. To me, it's it's all kind of particled um, in a way. I mean, I, I can feel that directly. Um, Partic particled means what? It's particles dancing. Mm. Um, so it's quite um, fluid. Mm. Um, and at the same time, I can stop and I mean that's the incredible miracles I can stop and I can put my hand on my hand and there's something that seems to be solid and guess what I get to feel my hand with this other hand yeah. and that is so <laughs> amazing because simultaneously there's also this direct experiencing that it's not it's not that and so we get this gift of, of experiencing ourselves as a human being mm -hmm. um, in the midst of uh, the dance of everything that is. <laughs> I mean, That's interesting. Well, you know, I mean, scientists would tell us that, you know, what appears to be solid and, and discrete and, you know, dense is actually anything but that. It's, it is particles dancing, not even particles. It's sort of probabilities percolating up out of, out of the, you know, the vacuum state and then yeah. dropping back. <laughs> and, uh, and but most of us don't experience it that way. Most people experience the world as concrete. And what you're saying is that you actually your day to day life is akin is in tune with what the scientists say that you're experiencing the sort of virtuality of things, and yet at the same time the solidity of things. And that, that paradoxically, both things are are enjoyed in one. It's a delight. I one mean, it's package. Just a, it's just you know that the foot falls and lands on something. <laughs> 
Uh -huh. <laughs> um, the whole thing, I mean, that the blood is pumping, that there's air that's being breathed, that, that something forms these words even right now. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if I look in that direction, I could be um, smothered in love. <laughs> huh. That's what it feels like. It feels like such an amazing gift that for no reason is happening and I get to be a part of it um, hmm. as this human being, you know. And it seems to have magnified with really taking care of her and turning around and embracing this woman that I am mm -hmm. um, and being tender and caring and um, all the all the bits and pieces that were imagined came from someplace else or from someone else. I've bit by bit given to myself, huh. found a way in the, to be creative when any kind of longing came up. How could I gift that to myself in some way? And um, did so, and, and slowly but surely then she, I opened up to uh, more and more relaxing into experiencing love itself. Um, mm directly not because of anything but here all the time mm -hmm. um, and so then other times I can be thinking well you know I'm hungry and I'll make some toast <laughs> sure <laughs> and then you know but if I even look at that if I stop and look at the moment there it's and then you get used to it I mean it's just unbelievable that uh, <laughs> you get accustomed to living like that and mm -hmm. and and so it's nice to um, speak about it sometimes. If, if there's something that I would have loved to be able to do, it's to give people a taste of what I experience. Um, and the only way, the closest I can come is by being with uh, people. Yeah. Well, that's always a motivation for me when I'm talking to people like this is, you know, what can we you know how, how, what can be said that would give others the taste of this it's not we don't want to just hear people's stories you know how it is for them I, we want to tune into actually enjoying that same level or same type of experience ourselves if if possible and appropriate and uh, I think there was a lot packed into what you just said that would be helpful for people I mean for instance you were saying that you gradually shifted from a lack of self-sufficiency, being dependent upon external things and people and whatnot for this, that, and the other thing, and then learning that to discover that what you were seeking externally was actually available internally. If you, I, I think you used the word caring and and some some words like that. If you if you sort of treated yourself with the right TLC or or tuned in to what was going on inside with sufficient um, clarity and subtlety. Right. In in just being with okay. What does she want now? You know, what is she mm -hmm. up to? Um, and we've all been trained to be field dependent. In yeah. other words, everything out here is going to give us what we want. You know, right? <laughs> and that's the falsity. That's mm -hmm. that's where the suffering, you know, um, comes in. That you know, love resides here with you. You experience it where you are. Mm -hmm. When somebody loves you, that gets opened in the heart area and you experience love right where you are. You don't actually experience it over there in the other person, right? Right, right. So it's like that. So if there's some, any kind of, um, you know, it's beautiful that it rose in me that, okay, to be in this relationship, you know, some sort of relating. Mm -hmm. Wanted to be in, you know, that's what kept rising and I was like totally irritated by that. Because <laughs> hmm. it's like, you know, oh, this darn thing. And so then I would see, okay, so what is it that, she's looking for in a relationship you know what is it that she feels is she's might be missing and when I asked that question in the moment of when the thought or the longing would occur oh if only I was in a relating right now um, then I'd be happy mm. right so in that moment stopping and seeing okay what is it that she's looking for um, so I did find it helpful to sort of be beside myself and see her as a third person like to to, to like when I say I talked about her and this yeah I was gonna say you refer to yourself in the third person it's kind of funny <laughs> <laughs> well because it, that's you know as a parent right mm -hmm. um, that's how I am with my sons I I 
see and tune in and, and to the best of my ability I'm I'm with them when they need me and I stand back when even though I want to meddle in their affairs mm -hmm. and just realize no you know let them follow their way out my thing is to let them know that I'm here with them and I'm available and all they need to do is say the word and I can I'll be with them to the you know and I don't even know if I can yeah. be supportive all I know is I'm willing to be supportive if ever yeah. you know and so I turned that around on myself mm -hmm. and I decided to become the parent that I am to them to myself mm, I and see. so it's almost like awareness and I mm -hmm. <laughs> are this team and uh, awareness watches the whole play of event mm -hmm. and, and, and sees when she's whatever in her humanness being human right <laughs> and then tends to her you know how how can i meet her you know but it, the eye it's just this weird thing because it's actually awareness yeah um and then inviting that not to there's no getting something there's only inviting mm -hmm. um and then you know allowing awareness to pick up when the offering comes whatever that is but in some ways it's been practical like um, ridiculously practical I guess I'm, I'm quite logical too <laughs> that occurs here this logic um, so if there was a need I, I remember feeling that I wanted to be held right that that was part of the pull of being with another is mm -hmm. I, I wanted to be held and uh, just that feeling that warmth of, of that and so there was some of that that I could give myself in just hugging myself. Mm -hmm. But what I found is I, I put pillows and everything on the couch and some blankets and I, I cozied myself, made a spot where I felt some pressure behind me and in front of me and I felt so held um, and just let myself totally feel that. Now some people would look at that and say, oh, poor woman, as if, you know, <laughs> pillows and everything is going to replace a, a, a warm man, you know, yeah. or, or woman, if that's, you mm -hmm. know, right. where people's interest goes. Um, and uh, it, to the, it did, it, it worked to a very large degree. Mm -hmm. um, and it came in the moment to feel and recognize that as Buddha's hand holding mm -hmm. me. Hmm. as if Buddha's hand was holding me and then it's like the covers and the pillows became loving and, and giving and supportive um, and so you know it came from me in the moment in how to meet that and I am guessing that absolutely every person on this earth if you look at it in the moment you will find a creative way or fool around with it a bit and find a way to meet uh, your own longings um, mm. you know looking in the moment mm -hmm. uh, not as a rule that oh I'm going to you know as some sort of extended beyond the moment idea I'm going to fulfill all my needs now you know and that's what my life is but although that's a pretty good one actually <laughs> maybe that would work <laughs> I don't know well you know it's it seems that we all have this we're, we're all sitting on an ocean of fulfillment or we are that ocean of fulfillment and and uh it's like we're all millionaires with with the money in a bank account that we've forgotten about and uh it's just a matter of getting to the bank account and you know tapping into it and then there it is there's yeah, there, get, getting out of the way yeah yeah exactly yeah um allowing ourselves to to just drop whatever's in the way uh of that flow of energy mm -hmm. do you find that um when things are really put to the test or or either positively or negatively let's say you receive unexpectedly receive a large sum of money or lose a large sum of money or you know someone cuts you off in traffic or all these different things um, do you understand do you feel that that is um, um, buffered by this sort of uh, sense that everything is you know, just bubbling particles and, and you know, not as substantial yeah. as it's ordinarily taken to be? Yeah, well, you know, it's it's uh, sudden things, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, some stuff it just doesn't, it's just neutral. Mm -hmm. So when we were in uh, Germany, you know, they, they canceled our train back to Paris, which meant that we couldn't get our flight from Paris to London. And <laughs> so, you know, it, it really 
mucked up a lot of stuff and it was just sort of like okay well now what right. what happens now and, and and seeing how can we meet this um and find get ourselves to london appropriately to be there for a meeting the next day um mm -hmm. and so there's that it was just it was just neutral um other times like i like how you say in driving so what i find is i might come up with uh uh, and maybe I'll even swear. So I don't know about swearing right here on this interview. <laughs> but, uh, well, sometimes what I'll, I'll come up, we'll say, oh, what the heck? You know, what? Or I'll say, what yeah. the hell? What the hell are you up to? You know, and I'll be saying it to the other driver. Mm -hmm. And then I'll quickly, I'll notice that in the moment. And then I'll say, oh, what the heaven are you up to? <laughs> <laughs> and immediately I'm laughing. Huh. And uh, the whole thing gets poof, you know, it gets get let, let go of or... Or I might send them a little bit of Reiki, um, mm -hmm. sort of. It's sort of, sort of still the touch is there, um, and then I I notice it and I, I I let it go. Yeah. Right, and that that happens very quickly, um, but certainly. You know, like when my knee went out of joint uh, as I was running across the road, I was extremely experiencing that as hey. I slowly fell towards the ground and landed on top of it, and there I was lying with the vision from being sideways on the sidewalk <laughs> going okay now what you know can i move my leg and and you know here i am on a sidewalk <laughs> uh and dealing with it just being with those details um to the best that i could inclusive of the shock uh, to the system and the surprise mixed with disappointment that it happened because I was mm -hmm. just feeling so alive and enjoying the that the body worked so well that I could be running across the street and feeling yeah. so free and then pop out goes mm. my knee mm. you know wham body gets slammed by cement um, and so forth right and so working and being with the moments in that until finding myself you know home and somebody had to carry me up the stairs and yeah the reason I ask is that it's um, you know sometimes it's easy to be all sort of smooth and go with the flow as long as nothing too serious is happening but you know, then when something really happens that's of you know like your knee going out or something then it's interesting to see how it holds up under such circumstances and uh, yeah or like you take extreme examples like Christ about to be crucified or something or actually going right. through that and um, it's I guess the reason I consider it relevant at all is that um, we all seem to be on a sliding scale in terms of how uh, solidly grounded we are in this and um, sometimes people kind of feel like they haven't made any progress or whatever if if they kind of go to pieces if they if something serious happens and um, maybe it's good to just sort of be easier on oneself and to well also as one expands right yeah. like it, as as one allows more love mm -hmm. then there's more love more space for whatever is ready to be healed next or to be with to be met yeah. Is really because that is really what healing is. It's just meeting these parts of ourselves and and being with them as they rise. So often people feel the bliss of the opening and the oneness and the no you know no separation and the the freedom of all of that, and then they mistake that because something rises within that they think they've lost it. Right, right. <laughs> because uh oh, now I'm angry. Yeah. <laughs> or or you know anger happening or whatever mm -hmm. that is and. And that's just, it's just, I can't speak in every instance, but it seems to be uh, a, a mistake that happens quite often, um, that people feel they've, they've lost it because the bliss it doesn't feel blissful particularly. Right. Um, yeah, that, that helps clarify, I think. That's clearer than the way I was trying to say it. Um, and, and also... I mean, it's worth pointing out, and many teachers have, that um, you know that which we're ultimately talking about here is not something which can come and go, or which does come and go. Bliss can come and go. You know, uh, yeah. health health can come and go, and having a functioning knee can come and go. You know, all all that stuff. Uh, but there's something underlying all that that um, doesn't come and go. 
and yeah. underlying it's holding it's pr- all yeah whole containing we should yeah, say man. Yeah. <laughs> containing with no container right right because <laughs> it has no edges and uh, is just the main uh, <laughs> experience of itself I, I don't know it's the yeah. solid part that's not solid <laughs> and that can be noticed I mean Oh, it's, totally, yeah. yeah. It's, like it's, it's pervading. It, it's mm-hmm. um, encompassing. It's, 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 and it's, it's in absolutely everything. It's just like I, I see you scratch your cheek, and, mm-hmm. you know, it's in the felt sense of the, the fingers touching the cheek and the felt sense of the scratch and the movement of the hand and, you know, uh, it's, it's speaking itself mm. like this mm-hmm. in this moment. This vastness is speaking itself as this brick, as this canal, um, and so it's it's allowing a person allowing themselves to relax, open into that, um, and so that's where the energies. It, it seems why I don't know. It's not really a why. It's just sort of how it happened with me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I can see looking back that uh, in supporting people to. Uh, find where energies are locked up inside, um, supporting them to find that, and then in sitting with it, relaxing open to it, um, then it it becomes part. It's no longer resistance. It's not resistance. It's it's part of the free flow of what's happening mm-hmm. in this expression of who they are. Let's explore a little bit more how you became so comfortable with this and so relaxed into it. I mean, you mentioned Isaac Shapiro, and in other talks I heard you mention Paul Lowe and some influence of Osho and different things. And obviously everybody's path is different, and you can't offer any kind of universal prescription and say that everybody should do what you did. But it's kind of interesting also to see how you know, you moved from one thing to the next and how different uh, things that you engaged in or encountered helped to, um, you know, open this up for you. Um, so maybe you could trace us a little bit of, over what you feel significant that, um, or what has been helpful, and particularly things that others might find helpful if the, if those things are still available. Well, I I was raised Catholic, uh-huh. <laughs> and. Uh, I believe it's available. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> um, now, not the you know the dogma, but the um, I I always felt um, attuned to or enjoyed like the scent of the incense, the sound mm-hmm. in the church, the mm-hmm. quietness that I could find there, and um, you know I I don't know whether it's because it's introspective. Um, or whether everybody is that way or not, but there was definitely something in the church. I, I at one point wanted to go to a Catholic college, um, but my parents didn't want to drive me. <laughs> there was no, it wasn't a public bus area, so uh, that didn't happen, and I'm grateful for that now. <laughs> Maybe, you know, again, uh, sort of protected a little bit, but um, from going into rules and regulations, right? Mm-hmm. Which, so subtracting that part, um, there was definitely some of those rules that I did do unto others as you do unto yourself mm-hmm. that that's been huge um, from before I mean I didn't really know anything about um, people being able to wake up or um, I just knew about Jesus and Buddha but I didn't even know that they were in an awakened state I didn't they were just religions, and, right. um, but that's one thing from the church. I definitely learned that in church: mm-hmm. do unto others as you would do unto yourself. Mm-hmm. And so, I would often just imagine how it would feel if I was the other person. Yeah. Now I don't that... know if that's actually what started this whole thing about actually feeling the other person, right? But certainly the interest was there uh, in what was happening for them and, and and a caring which a caring about what people feel and how comfortable they are and so that was there too um, but probably 
so much more caring about other people rather than myself. Mm -hmm. That, um, yeah, that's where I first learned it and then right. gradually turned that very same caring towards myself. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, and then uh, it was through uh, working with my first husband. I mean, we opened our relationship to Tantra from mm -hmm. a regular uh, way of being sexual together for, for um, the sensations of it. We changed it and, and grew together towards opening to love. Mm -hmm. And letting love be the the reason to meet in that way, and that the the sexual energies can support a deepening of our connection with each other. So um, I, I'm just gonna let my my son know that uh, the microphone isn't working, so we're using the room microphone. So he's being very quiet there. Good, good. Okay. <laughs> just in case there's some sounds. Yeah, just... I've got a few sounds around here too. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, the that sort of what we were looking to become closer and closer, mm -hmm. um, and then also I had gave birth to my sons, mm -hmm. um, and when my sons were born, I saw that they were innocent and whole. Mm -hmm. First one in 1990. Uh, it's just so obvious, innocent, completely innocent and whole. And that started a whole thing that my head couldn't quite, it just started with tons of emotions and, and uh, almost hysterical bit. And then when my second son came and he was the same way, see, so what it was is that I looked at, well, what happened to me? Why am I not innocent and whole? Why yeah. do I not feel innocent and whole? Because not only one, but then two, I could see from the birth of those two beings that we're all born innocent and whole, mm -hmm. that we all come in that way. Um, and so what happened? Yeah. You know, and that, so that became my question. And also I needed to, um, I wanted to not throw my anger towards my sons because they were innocent. I knew that when the anger rose up it was in both frustrations in me and it didn't have to do with them right. um, and yet there was this feeling to actually yell and, and, and as if they were somehow to blame because they might have triggered something open in me hmm. and so I started looking for a place that would help um, me because I felt I was going insane hmm. um, and actually was on a crisis line um, why did you feel you were going insane? all this I was afraid I was going to hurt them, um, and and I couldn't. Hmm. Um, I mean, hurt them physically, or I mean, you don't. So, I mean, we're, it doesn't. I mean, every mother gets angry, and so on. What was there anything abnormal about you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a little abnormal in a in a positive way that you that the birth of your sons was such a spiritual experience and that, that you were so deeply impacted by seeing them as innocent and whole. I mean, I don't know if other mothers feel that when they give birth, but it seems like it really impacted you more profoundly than normal. Well, but because, because what, what, I didn't believe I was, I was innocent, I was bad, right? I, I, oh, that's some of the old Catholic guilt maybe in there? Well, that, that everything that was good about me was, was either from my father, from my mother, from my auntie Lee or you yeah. know, from somebody else, and everything that was bad was mine. Oh, okay. Right, so that's how I was raised. Um, uh -huh. now, and that's a normal way. It's not to say anything against my, my mom and dad and I were very good friends, and um, so there's a hesitancy in, in speaking a, a lot about what, you know, kind of stuff happened, sure. because they're, they were innocent, and it was just stuff that happened to them as well. Yeah, they were doing the best they could. They were doing the best they could, and um, so yeah, anger at times were, was unleashed towards towards me as a child, and yeah. so when I had children, it was a natural modeling that um, you were starting to do that too. I, I I wanted to, but couldn't. Yeah. So that created a feeling of un, you know, because I wasn't there was no unleashing. It was just. Oh, I see. You're bottling it up. Yeah, I was bottling it up because I yeah. couldn't couldn't take it there, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And so, 
I phoned a crisis line one night, um, mm -hmm. and uh, he said, "Well, I mean, you, you can't uh, in Canada here. You you can get help if you're suicidal, mm -hmm. <laughs> but." I had earlier, at an earlier time, I had attempted suicide, so I knew that I, I wasn't suicidal because I, mm. from that experience, yeah, I would never, never commit suicide because I know that the life force is just really super strong here, and and yeah. uh, so I could contemplate that, but it would never. It's just a fact for me mm -hmm. <laughs> because I explored that, um, but in this uh, this night that I thought I was going to be swallowed up by this black hole, you know, I, I, I felt, okay, you know, I, I phoned this crisis line and, and um, he said, what's this is, what you're dealing with is he just asked a few questions about my upbringing and, um, you know, stuff that had happened. And he said, well, you're just dealing with emotions. You need mm -hmm. to get some help and, and suggest that I go to ACOA, which is Adult Children of Alcoholics. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and there, I just told people in the group, I need help, you know. And somebody recommended this PD seminars, a uh, place over on Gabriel Island that I started to go to, where they supported me with phone blocks and stuff to be with the anger uh, and let it unfurl, let it, but you know, appropriately with a, a phone block where other people would hold the blocks. You could punch it or something. Yeah, yeah and breathe, yeah. breathing through it, like really mm -hmm. allowing the energy to come mm -hmm. um, appropriately. And so then I, I learned to do that on the futon at home. Mm -hmm. So if energies rose up, I would I would just let my kids know, okay, I need to go and hit the futon a bit. I'll be back. <laughs> and I would go, right? And, yeah. uh, and uh, that it wasn't about, uh, you know, them. Right. And uh, so things started to really shift and and that's when I started to have some experiences and then the Reiki came in mm -hmm. um, and the Reiki changed my life because the first experience, everything disappeared mm -hmm. and all that was left was this white light and, and that's a fact. Yeah. <laughs> that's here. Um, it's not... It, it opened so I could see that it was here, and that's just a truth um, for me. Yeah. So it's made life quite different, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so re when you did the Reiki, it was something that some was being done to you, or something you were doing, or what? I don't know too much yeah, about right. Reiki. My, um, my cousin was getting her um, reflexology um, mm -hmm. registration, so she had to practice on 30 people. So she was practicing on you. Yeah, she asked if I would be a guinea pig. And you opened up and in, into white light. Uh, yeah. Well, she did the reflexology, and then at the end, um, so reflexology is that muscle testing? Is that what no, reflexology? No, that's, that's the, on the feet. Reflexology on the feet. Okay, yeah, they, massaging they, the feet. Yeah, they do the little um, acupressure points. And yeah, and, they, and, they, and it corresponds to different parts of the body. And yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's an actual physical pressing. Right. And at the end of that, she she massaged my aura, huh. and now uh, I didn't even know what an aura was at the time, right. really. And what, when she did that, I just went, oh, what is that? I love it. Whatever it is you're doing, mm -hmm. please keep. And she just said, well, I'll go wash my hands and I'll give you some Reiki. Hmm. So uh, she came and put one hand on my forehead and one hand on my chest and we moved some energy. Uh, and then I instructed her. It came from my mouth, but there was no thought prior to it to press her palms against my palms. And she did. My body flopped around a bit and then everything including me her the table the world uh, disappeared hmm. and there was this white light that was all that there was and sort of some it wasn't really time it was more like three beats of space I guess um, and so then and that just that was a shift and and that it, it didn't sort of and it sounds like it was a sort of a, a, a permanent um, you know, it was a milestone, and things weren't the same after that. It Absolutely. sounds like, from what you're saying. Yeah. Well, that, then I realized that I didn't have to fight. I didn't yeah. have to struggle so hard. Huh. Um, I didn't understand that those were also what resistance is. Yeah. Because at that time, it wasn't to. It wasn't a, that I was on a, any kind of spiritual direction, right? I was just wanting to not hurt my children. Um, 
it sounds like the you know the fact that you're very sensitive and empathic and and all this um it sounds like that i mean your makeup is such that throughout your life you have perhaps had a more profound reaction to certain things than um, many people might have. I mean, you smoke that joint when you're 15 and all of a sudden there's this huge change, you know, and you, you do Reiki and all of a sudden there's this huge thing. Um, you know, so you, you're, you're kind of a finely tuned instrument, it seems to me, and, and um, you know, some people are a little bit more thick-headed, myself included. But, <laughs> but um, you know, you, you have quite a profound uh, sensitivity that... Um, enables you to uh, really, uh, I mean, Isaac Shapiro said one word and a big shift happened. I mean, it, 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 that fascinates me, the, the fact that, you know, you could be so m maybe malleable is a good word, you know, the, the, this influence, this influence, uh, you know, evoke, evokes huge changes in, in your, your makeup and your whole way of being, which apparently are permanent. Yes, well, and, it, you know, it, I, I, it's true. I'm very sensitive, and and life has been quite different for me. Even, you know, as a kid, it was just different. Mm -hmm. I just watched everything because how everybody else was reacting to stuff was totally different than what I was seeing. Yeah. And experiencing, and I didn't understand it. I just stopped talking and was with it all as best as I could be. Mm -hmm. You know, um, because if I pointed to it, people told me, you know, thought you're an oddball. Well, that I was ridiculous. Don't yeah. be so stupid. I mean, what are you talking about? That's not what, you know, and and definitely perhaps when I look back somewhat threatened by what I would point to. Um, and also I definitely was very straightforward and just said things and that wasn't good as a kid either. <laughs> yeah. These days we have what, you know, they, they call the indigo children who are these sort of special kids and they're very, you know, psychic or empathic or whatever. But, you know, it seems like there have always been people like that. Maybe they're beginning, get, becoming more common. But, um, well, that's you know, all I, the Reiki. You know, when I attune people, uh, so I've, you know, been practicing Reiki for 18 years now mm -hmm. um, since that point. And I took the training only to find out what the heck happened to me because I didn't understand this white light thing. Yeah. Except for that I knew that it was bigger than everything that's uh -huh. appearing here. Um, but I, I still was looking to understand it as a human being, and, sure. and that's what led me into this. Uh -huh. So also I became a, a Reiki master so that I can attune people, and all that is is an opening of the crown chakra to your own listening to yourself mm -hmm. of your, from your uh, seventh chakra here. All that is means all Reiki is? Well, it's an attunement. It opens the crown chakra. That's that's what that's Reiki, what a Reiki is. initiation is. That's its ultimate purpose. No, well, that's what when you take Reiki level one or oh. two, you know, you, oh, that's you what have happens. These initiations and it's you uh -huh. commit to it by paying for it, and mm -hmm. then it it deliberately opens the crown. Huh. And so then people do open to their sensitivities or or however it is they see energies. Like it, the the trick is is that you will be re hearing energies. Uh, in your own way, so you can't compare it. Does it work that way for everybody? Yeah. I mean, oh, there, there, nobody flunks the class. Nobody <laughs> flunks the class. It's just basically, are you interested to explore uh, listening to your own intuitive and higher self directly? Mm -hmm. uh, if you're interested in that, and then Reiki just gives a container and how to play with it. So the, the you, training somehow gives you a technique or a practice or a, a way of of having that happen. Um, well, there's the attunement, so that just happens. That's it. It's done. Uh, yeah. So it's like you opened a door, but you can't. So, shut, some can't somebody shut. else ha enables that to happen, or you yourself have that happen somehow in the practice. I actually do the initiation on people. Uh, uh, and then when you do, then it opens up for them. Yep. And then they theoretically could become trained and do that for others and so on. Uh yeah. 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 Oh. It's just learning how to do the uh, initiation. Okay. Um, with others. Mm -hmm. And then it's the practicing. So it, it, the crown gets opened and the person's interest is in healing for themselves yeah. and others. Mm -hmm. And so um, through time and practicing Reiki, that's what I mean. That, that So that sensitivity that I was already born with, like the color of my eyes or the shape of my nose. So it's, to me, it's not special because it's just what's here. It was given. Right. 
and and yet it's all special just like the color of my eyes yeah. and the shape of my nose because it's just happened that way <laughs> but unlike your eyes and your nose the fact that you sort of made a, a practice of it and put attention on it has enabled it to blossom more and more yeah and, over and, 18 and years and thankfully because it gave me a direction that finally my world i would i could offer it I, yeah. I could be with people and people actually wanted it you know yeah. and and so compared to just being by myself with whatever was happening and, and apparently nobody really interested in in this viewpoint right yeah oh yeah. lovely kitty yeah here she is <laughs> Do, 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 do. Uh, I think nice. she's starting to think about lunch. I think. Um, so, but obviously, you, you didn't stop there. I mean, you, you know, because you've gone on to these other things, and so Reiki became part of your toolkit. It sounds like, yeah. but um, you know, then there were. I've heard you mention other things. So there must have still been a, a sort of a quest or a sense that well, you know, keep going. There, there's more to discover. Well, what I noticed is that that. Uh, Gabriola, the the place, the workshops place that I would go to, this PD seminars. Um, I was taking um, workshops like on a weekend or whenever I could, because of course I had young children at home. Um, so when things got to be where I was having a hard time handling regular life, um, I would give myself a weekend over there to be with myself and learn what's going on and give myself the space. Um, you know, just to see what's going on. And so I noticed that the people that I was mostly attracted to, to do their workshops, started disappearing. <laughs> and so each time I would go and I would look for them on the, you know, on the roster to see mm -hmm. what are they offering next, they wouldn't be there. And, and they were all going to travel with this guy, Paul Lowe. Mm. So, um, so of course I got curious um, yeah. about that. And, and, uh, so it was actually Paul Lowe's book. Uh, he came to Vancouver, I guess it was in 1995, mm -hmm. um, and I bought his book. I felt drawn to go and see who this was, but um, I didn't actually go to a workshop of his for another two years hmm. after that, um, but brought the book with me on this trip to South America. And so my husband and I were, you know, reading it sort of together and, and exploring um, what he was saying but one of the things was is that you know the experiment is over you can wake up hmm. and so this is the first you know I'm hearing about this waking up stuff and uh, so I say okay wake up to myself uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, I knew it wasn't it <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know and so kind of it, went... it wasn't it mean you didn't wake up as <laughs> That's uh, right. to, yeah now, this, uh, if this is not hopefully this is not a diversion, but um, some a couple of weeks ago, some guy from Italy emailed me and said you got to check out Paulo. So I looked up Paulo, and the first thing I saw was a whole group shot of a bunch of people sitting there naked. And I thought, okay, well, this guy's from Italy, you know. So uh, you know, the prime minister of Italy has bunga bunga sex parties with seventeen-year-olds. So I guess that makes sense, but it doesn't seem like something that'd be appropriate for my show. Um, <laughs> but is that the same guy? And what's that all about? <laughs> Sounds like the same guy. <laughs> um, so, what Paul Paul's space now? It was about um, seeing who you are and what you were afraid of, mm -hmm. um, and he liked to go right out to the edge of yeah. everything, inclusive of sexual sexuality. Mm -hmm. So, where are you afraid? Are you actually afraid of? Like if you're a man of other gay men or, mm -hmm. you know, do you have a homophobia inside yourself? And then he would invite, well, what do you know if you haven't experienced it directly? Mm -hmm. How could you be so sure? Um, and then what is this fear about, right? So is the fear rising for some reason? So how would, he, how would he have you explore? I mean, would you go and have sex with a man even if you weren't gay or something like that? Or what, If you've had a fear around it or a resistance to it, it's uh, what Paul would invite is attraction or reaction. So... Uh -huh. Either you're attracted to something or you're reacting to something. Both are invitations to move towards yourself. And if you're neutral about it, then it may not be an area you need to it's explore? Not, yeah, it's not I see. Issue. Okay. So um, all the different, of course, you know, in our Western, Western, in all of the walks of life, there are um, 
all sorts of things around sexuality and what's allowed and what isn't allowed what's taboo what's not taboo yeah uh, and it's interesting that so many so often you'll you know some preacher who has been railing against homosexuality will end up having you know being caught in some homosexual relationship you know he's the one who's shouting the loudest against it right <laughs> yeah that's exactly exactly yeah. uh, this sort of thing so so for that you know a lot of people would be very uncomfortable and call Paul Lowe wrong yeah um, and for sure it did attract some people who were maybe just wanting to mess around with the sensation sexual and you know yeah. be able to be with all these people who are being open so mm -hmm. um, but he was trying to be an iconoclast he was trying to break people's boundaries and and and, uh, and re uncover their phobias and supporting them yeah 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 helping them do that yeah and right. uh, and he he is more of a guru so he he has people you know that he's the one that says stuff and, and mm -hmm. people believe that and so that part of you know I was sort of there because of his book but also because the people he attracted um, were just such high caliber people of mm -hmm. interest in, and homeopathic doctors and, and really uh, you know if they're willing to go exploring on the extreme edge like that they're pretty amazing people yeah, um, and and also he liked to invite something called a sharing of inner dialogue. So mm -hmm. whatever it is that the mind is coming up with, with judgments and stuff, to actually just say it out loud instead of keeping it inside to yourself. Mm. And so this would create a, a completely beautiful level of intimacy as we all would practice this sharing of our inner dialogue. It um, again would open and release. Uh, tensions around uh, the truth and mm -hmm. being willing to expose that to others in honesty um, again has its uh, merits of mm -hmm. opening to oneself so that which is hidden of course gets exposed right and then you know how humbling uh, is that so so that kind of work isn't attractive to a lot of people because they don't really want to share what they're truly thinking what they're truly feeling well, in a certain sense, though, I mean, you know, there were the encounter groups of the 60s and early 70s where you just spill all your garbage, and um, some of that was of dubious value. You know, there's just a, sometimes it's better not to sort of just, I do, I mean, you can disagree with me, but it seems to me sometimes it's just bad manners to divulge well, everything you're it's, thinking. It's you kind know. of funny because later um, I did yeah. end up, you know, going to Rose Bank to Australia and living in. Um, a house with a bunch of people who were also um, with Paul Lowe, you know, mm -hmm. and practicing uh, sharing their inner dialogue and all that. Yeah. Um, but the reason I, you know, hindsight again, that what that group gave me was a place to let go of my life. So mm -hmm. Paul did say, you know, to the whole group at Harbin Hot Springs, well, you know, you have to let go of your life of the world as you know it in yeah. order to experience this that I'm pointing to and when I heard that I knew it was true for me and, and you I actually was, yeah you actually left moment. your husband and your kids at that I point I stood right? up in that moment at Harbin and I was ready to just go walking out from Harbin in, right then and go with nothing and my knee had gone out of joint then <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> so I would have had to use crutches wow. and put my thumb out on the road and just let life take me mm -hmm. and uh, he Paul said, hold it, hold it, hold it. You don't have to do it like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, you need to, you know, you can do it with support. And so then that's, I needed to go home uh, to my children, you know, and, mm -hmm. and husband at the time and work out what we could arrange so that I could be free to, mm -hmm. you know, let go um, without knowing what was going to happen. I mean, we gave, we gave me a six month period and then we would see what would, need to happen from there mm -hmm. um, but I needed to let go of everything um, yeah so went down to like one box of mostly rocks and feathers and books <laughs> that's that's all I that's what I kept mm -hmm. <laughs> of my old life and uh, of course all the experiencing was still with me yeah uh, all the connection everything it's just the belongings that I let go of 
right and i I heard you say that you pretty much left your family for uh, maybe only for i mean the kids that you're referring to now your son who was making noise in the kitchen are those the same kids that you left then so you came back to your family or different husband maybe but you 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 didn't like permanently walk away from your children or anything no but at the time i didn't know that i would be going i honestly did let them go without knowing what What would happen happen. yeah and that wasn't easy yeah i can't imagine uh, yeah and so that's what it's funny when you're talking about the benefits of the sharing the inner dialogue and all that stuff uh, and giving each other feedback on where mm-hmm. a person. So then I ended up in this house with all these other Paul Lowe people, right? Mm-hmm. And and I ended up just not saying a lot because everything I said, if I, you know, none of them had left their children. Right. They, they had no idea uh, what I was experiencing in, in that. And so... If I attempted to share something, they would all jump on what I said and say, "Oh, well, I'm not being present because my children aren't here right now." And you know, but what was present was a huge upheaval um, as I was letting go. What I realized afterwards is that I have to be with my children, mm-hmm. that I have to be with them in some way. So what I actually let go of was the form of it, was right. the goal. Was having it, you, you let go of having it define you, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and okay. in, in some sort of have to. Right. right. So, you know, it became very clear prior to doing that, I saw that they were, my husband at the time and my children, were like a cha- chain shackle, a mm. ball and chain around my ankle that I was using as an excuse to not do what I knew I had to do. Hmm. And so when I saw that, that clearly, I knew I had to uh, let them go and find out what this was that was calling me inside. And of course, some, some, people would, some people would accuse you of being self-indulgent and irresponsible for doing something like that. Like but... all of my family, yeah. Right, oh yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So against, yeah, everybody, nobody wanted me to do what I was doing. A few right. people could feel it and felt completely drawn Uh, Mm -hmm. Most people were very threatened. Um, You know, I didn't just leave my kids. I mean, they were they were uh, five and six years old. I didn't leave them in a ditch or something. You know, Um, right? I left them with their father, willing to be with them. Yes. Um, But I didn't know that. So you severed the ties in a responsible manner. You didn't just go walking out and. Yeah, and I didn't really know that. I still felt like I was doing something wrong. Yeah, I'm sure it must have been very a, a big, huge. It was both, right? I knew yeah. I had to do what I I had to step away from everything, hundred mm-hmm. percent. Yeah. Um, and then, at the same time, I felt like I was torturing myself. <laughs> yeah. Well, it took a lot of courage. I mean, it was a very bold thing to do. It was. It was a very, and it was necessary. And it, of course, I'm once, not saying everybody in the world should do it, but you you'd had to, and I had to. There was no. Doubt yeah. That was the direction I. For, for this person and so that's what I support people it's it's what's right for them and what's true for them not yeah. to do what I did because it you know but if sometimes people get triggered open and know when they hear these words that oh boy um, they can do yeah. something about that you know and, and but they'll find their way and it's important that they find their unique way of opening to all that is I mean, yeah, there are no universal prescriptions, but um, but it it is interesting to hear what people have gone through, such as yourself, as as long as it's offered with the proviso that you're not you know saying everyone should do this. But it's it's fascinating to hear you know the path the paths that different people have taken. Yeah, and I mean, you, and you can see how it. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say that like, I didn't know when Paul Lowe said that in at Harbin, and I knew when he said it that that's what I that's what had to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't know that that's what renunciation was. So I, I didn't know until afterwards that that's what I had done is renounce my life. Yeah. Um, I didn't know that. All I knew is that I needed to let go of everything so I could see and feel whatever this was that was calling inside. And the I would say that's a form of renunciation. You I know, guess. there's also yeah. an inner renunciation, which in which one could have very well renounced to a profound degree, while yet appearing to be completely involved in all the the normal aspects of life. But I, I really do think that sometimes a, an external uh, renunciation, such as you did, can be instrumental 
in you know breaking a lot of ties and boundaries and perhaps right. and it, perhaps, it, perhaps it, leading to the internal renunci- like, like right now I'd say you're probably in a very renounced state even though you're back in the family right it, yeah those those lines of whatever you know I never they were never picked up again right um, I met my sons newly and mm-hmm. needed to learn how to figure it all out um, as we went along to yeah. the best of my ability um, as equals mm-hmm. so it totally changed um, how we were together and uh, yeah. yeah so yeah, well, you're not your average mom I mean how are your kids turning out how old are they now they're 19 and 21 uh-huh. and uh, they I the reason I live in North Vancouver is that I moved back here um, from Massachusetts um, I, I am Canadian born yeah. uh, but I was living in Massachusetts because that's where when I left my life, that's where my ex-husband took the boys. I see. Um, and so I went there to be with them, and mm-hmm. so lived there for a couple of years, and then brought them back to Canada with me, mm-hmm. because that's what was true of this part to be with them was the only direction. Yeah. And so sure. now they're um, they're totally resourceful to their their own selves. I they don't come to me for me to show them how to be happy or as if I'm going to give them their happiness mm-hmm. right uh, they've learned to access their own self and support themselves and I can be here and support them if need be um, but they're able to respond they're responsible they're able to respond to their own scenarios um, to a, a, such a high level that my heart is completely at rest that's great uh, you know, of course, I, I love them and I want them to mm-hmm. be happy and everything. Um, and when things happen that maybe aren't so comfy for them, I, I feel that and I let them be. Yeah. Um, because I don't, what am I, how do I know what they're supposed to be going through, you know? Were their teenage lives um, fairly smooth? I mean, they didn't get real, too, too crazy? <laughs> you mean the drugs and alcohol stuff? Yeah, all that stuff <laughs> and the stuff that a lot of us went through. I mean, yeah. uh, well, I mean, well, again, I spoke with them long before uh, and shared with them what happened with me with the marijuana and mm-hmm. uh, with alcohol. They were part of you know my life at that time. They were yeah. maybe three and four years old or something like mm-hmm. that. But um, certainly, I shared when I was a teenager what I did, and I I did go to lots of parties and did all sorts of things that were completely dangerous and yeah. drinking and driving and all the stuff that, that we did was crazy. Yeah. Um, but I made it through and right. that. And so I said, well, um, I'd prefer to know when you start exploring um, so I can be with you in heart. Mm-hmm. You know, not that, you know, of course I would love to actually be there too, but yeah. <laughs> do the driving. Like, not likely mom is yeah. <laughs> going to be there with you. And so they uh, explored and shared with me when they were exploring um, with alcohol and with uh, smoking marijuana and Mm -hmm. what that was like for them and, you know, um, yeah, and so there's been some bits where, yeah, phone call and late in the night to come and pick them up and, Mm -hmm. um, it's great. It's really, really beautiful and it's like we can go through hard times together. Yeah. uh, Being mutually supportive. You know, it's different. Yeah, it seems healthier than the average, you know, relationship that kids have with their parents. I mean, I'm sure there are many other good examples, but this is a, it seems like it's worked out, you know. I mean. So far, so good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so far, and then, you know, I still imagine that they're going to need to go through some workshops and deal with whatever I did and, and, you know, maybe some abandonment stuff when I did leave them to it with their father. And Yeah. But I don't know if that's, you know, I talk openly about that. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a, that's a workshop right there, you know. Just the fact that you're so communicative with them, you're help, I'm sure you're helping them resolve things that, you know. Yeah, they they're, they're <laughs> they, they just shake their head with me. <laughs> yeah. They they uh, you know my one son's come to satsang and just so he can see what it is that I do, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know his feedback was, oh. You're just being you. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it was sort of like okay, it wasn't, and it was it was magnified because of the interest in the container of satsang. Right. Um, 
but uh, both of them are, are amazing people. I'm honored that they are part of my life and, and their sensitivities are whatever they are. They're not playing in them directly, but they're totally aware that they're part of uh, what's happening in their mm-hmm. own experiencing of their lives. That's great. So, so you had your Paul Lowe phase, and then you, you alluded to Isaac Shapiro. I mean, um, was there at any point in, in your life the big aha grand turnaround you know some you know some people refer to that sort of thing like i when i had my awakening it was like a you know watershed moment night and day difference things have never been the same since and so far you've alluded to sort of a number of milestones but um yeah. has there you know with with isaac was that what you were referring to there just that that was yeah. really the the big kahuna that was the big kahuna. <laughs> the kahuna met the kahuna. <laughs> and it's been a kahuna ever since. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's uh, the awareness realized itself. Um, hmm. And it's not, it's nothing's been built up since then. There's been no, uh, it can't go away. I cannot move out of the moment. Right. I've, I've played with this. To test Try, it out and move seeing if you it. can move out, yeah, yeah, just to see, okay, you know, and it, it's like it just, and of course, that playing with it just solidified it even more. <laughs> what would you do to try to move out of the moment? Oh well, I, I, I think I shared this in the, in an interview somewhere. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I tried. I got really super drunk uh-huh. to see if I could make it go away. Make it go away, lose it somehow. Yeah. Um, and no. Awareness was aware when double vision was happening, and yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> and the you know, the the response to the alcohol in the body the next day. And thankfully, I do have Reiki, right? So yeah, even though there's the feeling of the body attempting to deal with the poison, um, right? I can use Reiki to soothe myself as that's happening. <laughs> yeah, and and presumably that was an experiment you didn't need to repeat. <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't. Then I, right. I smoked some marijuana too mm-hmm. to see what would happen. Uh, yeah. And there was some stuff uh, with a, a shaman who was um, doing ayahuasca journeys. Mm-hmm. You did that? Uh, well, first he invited me, because of the state of awareness, to be with people. Yeah. And so I was there just with people without taking anything myself. Mm-hmm. And I would kind of journey with them because of the sensitivities I can, right? Yeah, you're tuning uh, into... Yeah, just tuning, just being with them completely. Mm-hmm. Um so we could travel together with whatever it was that was going on for them. And then uh, it occurred to not be afraid of drugs anymore, Mm -hmm. to see what it would be like and to trust the shaman and trust awareness that, because I was still giving it some power if I was afraid of it. Yeah. As if it could have some power over me. Uh And so I I tried it and it was beautiful, lovely. yeah, actually, ecstasy was the first one, uh-huh. uh, and then the ayahuasca, and then journeying with people with the ayahuasca, um, and it was fine. It was just, it just opened other doorways of awareness. So, so as in the midst of all that self being aware of itself, and yet this whole thing caused by ayahuasca. I mean, in other words, that the sort of the ground state continuum of self aware of itself was unperturbed by the whatever effect the ayahuasca had yeah 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 well the ayahuasca just felt like something was searching around and looking under rocks and nooks uh-huh. and fannies and searching all through the system to find something that and it didn't find anything so yeah um, that was that i didn't need to huh. explore that anymore you know there was that story from Ram, Ramdas Be Here Now where he went and saw Neem Karoli Baba in India and had, had some LSD in his pocket and Neem Karoli Baba said, you brought the pills and you give them to me and he just popped like several of them, you know, more than anyone would ordinarily take and yeah. no, nothing happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I heard that. Yeah, that's yeah. like the ecstasy. The first time it was with the fear and it was just a like liquid honey mm-hmm. sort of flowing through and there was a lot of seeing stuff. The next time, uh, it was with people who were doing it recreationally, yeah. And I just meditated, and it, it just was sort of a hum. Hmm. And then the next time, it was nothing at all. Yeah, nothing. So, have you satisfied with your curiosity with all that sort of experimentation? Yeah. Done yeah. that? Been there? Well, to that degree, I I don't know what. Wait, what else? Yeah, but certainly, there's not a fear of drugs anymore. 
Yeah, and you're um, not, but you feel no need to sort of test to see, you know, what effect this, that, or the other thing is going to have on your awareness. It's sort of like no, it's been 14 years. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, in this this other part of what's happening as far as there's a lifetime and there's a human being that's traveling. Yeah. In in what we call time, and we, you know, contain the moments in this time thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One thing, if you've watched any of my interviews, you may have heard me ask, and um, is that, you know, having established self-realization, or whatever terminology you want to use, um, most people that I talk to, even sort of very, you know, well-known, well-respected teachers, such as Gangaji and Adyashanti and people like that, they all seem to say that, yeah, but that, that's not the end of the journey, and it's not the end of the exploration. There's, there seems to be no end to the unfoldment or refinement. Or well, that's, that's why I say I don't know, right? When you say is the experimenting over, I don't yeah. know. Um, it seems like um, the way that the exploring comes up is, is there a fear around it? And so, um, you know, the only thing that occurs to me in this moment is uh, I, I believe there is some fear yes uh, mm -hmm. around getting laser eye surgery oh, right. <laughs> and uh, and so I've been toying with this all my brothers and sisters have had it and I yeah. you know I still wear hard contact lenses at night mm -hmm. that reshape my eyes for mm. during the day but um, I've been uh, afraid to and yet it would be totally supportive for clear vision uh, yeah I know people who have undergone it, and they all say it's great, you know, it made a big difference. Yeah, and so, you know, I feel like that maybe that's going to happen in the spring, and, and yet, yeah. you know, there's parts of me that still play out the whole Catholic thing that, you know, if I'm looking for clear vision, am I being ungrateful for what I do have? Yeah. So that's how you know that's up. that's like saying if I'm eating healthy food, am I, you know, instead of donuts, am, am I? Well, you know, it's like you know you you, right. you you help your body and that's function right. as well as it can. <laughs> and, that's, and that's true, right? It's like it's 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 all the different things. Um, you know, it's like treating myself as a woman instead of uh, something that's neither a man or a woman. You know, right? Just enjoying her as she is, mm -hmm. and doing what's appropriate and at the same time because there's been so much questioning around this issue I do get that there is something for me in the learning of that even if it is just to let go and do it and trust um, yeah in a way have you found that the learning has accelerated as a result of the you know self-realization that somehow lessons are learned more quickly and more appropriate lessons are sort of encountered yeah, it's it's more of a it's it's not so extreme. You, know? you don't have to do such radical stuff, you mean, to to learn well, lessons, or, or or the learning doesn't come in such a radical way. It so. doesn't have to be so demonstrative or so. Yeah, yeah it's not extreme, so the the results aren't as extreme. It's more smooth, subtle. Yeah, it's more smooth and subtle. It, well, you know, it it. it uh, you know, it's weird to say, but you get used to it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, and then you know, sometimes in a moment, there can be something like angels are holding me close, and and it's literally beautiful. Literally. You see, you see them, or sense their presence, or what? Absolutely. Both. Yes. Huh. So if if that's what comes up, right? It's yeah, not, yeah. It's not. Um, where I tune in a hundred percent of the time or whatever, but it's just like that. This is heaven. It I'm is. glad you mentioned it actually, because a lot of people, most people, don't mention that sort of thing. And and um, you know, I've always heard that there is this sort of more celestial realm, and that um, w once self-realization has been established, the capacity to tune into that is going to be enhanced, or maybe enhanced. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's. I, I don't know if it's been more it's probably more with the Reiki and stuff mm. yeah you that, were sort um, of that yeah the for a time that you know Mikael the Archangel Michael uh -huh. used with me in you know just for a chunk of time when I was in Massachusetts mm -hmm. very very literally <laughs> mm. um, so literally as meaning almost like as, as if concrete perception almost 
literally. But to me, it was concrete. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, you know, walking down the street and having him with his wings around me, walking wow. right beside me. Huh. Um, and uh, so, and, yeah. There's that and you knew, it, you knew it was him for some, so, yeah, somehow. So it was yeah. Huh. And why was he doing that, do you think? In support of me. Um, I guess, you know, living like this, being sensitive, um, there's been a, because people haven't been very caring <laughs> mm -hmm. um, up until now, perhaps, or, you know, but, you know, of course, over time, uh, that realm has been extremely with me, um, even as a child, oh. um, as a support. So, you know, and then there was a time where it was like, oh, yeah, well, to heck with the humanness, because, you know, I, I have this whole other realm of, of angels and spirits loving me. Mm -hmm. um, who needs humans, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's more about being with other human beings as a as a, a, a joyful encounter or whatever it is. I mean, hmm. sometimes just feeling drawn, like my heart just starts to beat, and then I'm like, oh, great, okay, now I have to say something, you know, because my heart saying, all right, say something, and that's how it tells me sometimes is it might beat really, really hard, and and say, okay, now, now, now. <laughs> and I guess it's like the Quakers, right? They get shaken. Huh. I don't totally get what you're saying right now. You, your heart literally starts beating hard and you, you feel compelled to say something. In what context? Well, sometimes, sometimes it's like in, in participating in a, a like conversation a... Or, or, or like there's a, we, we are part owners, my dad and us um, are halfers in a condo down in Mexico. And uh -huh some of the stuff that goes on as far as um, the rules and regulations and what people are without all the owners getting to vote. Um, so a part of me stands up and so I, I kind of roll my eyes at myself <laughs> and say, okay, here she goes. <laughs> in other words, you just have to play an assertive role sometimes, sometimes to deal yeah, with situations. situation. I, I that ex example it's like when consciousness calls on me directly sometimes it's stronger and mm -hmm. I may first feel that the part of me would go okay well I'm not touching this right mm. yeah and then my heart beating strongly it's like life says oh yes you are huh. <laughs> and then seeing what happens how what am I going to say with this and what shows up um, all I know is that I mean that's that's the only thing that's leading me is what my heart Besides basic stuff, you know, it's the body, the stomach might feel hungry, so I'll feed myself, you know, mm -hmm. or thirsty or whatever. Um, the whole thing's playing itself out. Yeah. And so um, the heart is sort of the bigger leader. But in conjunction with uh, the mind and, and however the flavor of who I am, mm -hmm. it all comes in. It's all available to yeah. come into play in the moment. Good. <laughs> I mean, that's refreshing in a way because there's there's some people who talk who who put such strong emphasis on the fact that there is nobody at home, you know, and it. it um, but that's the gorgeousness of it. it is, yeah, that's nobody talking to nobody right now. And right. Yet there's also this that appears here that could easily be absolutely not here, but it is. Yeah. There is this, Rick, you know, there is the felt sense of your feet in, on the floor, you mm -hmm. know. There's this whole play of its own self that's in the nothing. The nothing yeah. is playing itself as nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. It, it's, uh, it's true. Um, and to me, the joy is being with the appearance, the play of it all. It's a dance. Exactly, and and the I guess another way of putting it is that the absolute view and the relative view are not mutually exclusive. You know, it's it, the the two, uh, if if they can be seen as two, uh, are part of the, the whole package. And um, you know, and it sounds like you know you live a very kind of engaged life in many ways. Um, you know, you're not uh, beating the drum of 
in personality. There's there's also a, a very vibrant personal expression. Yes, uh, yes, with, and it's, it's 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 in dropping into that. Yeah, yeah. That's the love. I mean, so the perspective here is that it's all love. You right. Know, absolutely, literally, that's so. Um, love doesn't deny itself. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right? It just doesn't. It just doesn't. I mean, why or whatever? I don't know. It just doesn't. It's just right. not part of... So the character, the... Sure, I mean, I'm just a human being. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say things that people won't like and other people will. And, you know, it's like, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with it the best I can. And, um, you know, apologize if that's what's necessary. It mm -hmm. feels sure. right to me. And usually that just opens another door. Yeah. Of uh, being closer with people. So um, it all seems to just work uh, anyway, even if it is glitchy at times. <laughs> um, yeah, and there's an en enjoyment. You know, is that what we're here for? To be in joy. Um, is that a choice? I'm not, I'm not sure, but that's what I like to support for people. Yeah, I, I heard a beautiful quote the other day, and maybe we can close with some with a con, con, brief consideration of this. It was something like I should write it down, but it was something like God became man, so man could become God, or could realize God, or something. It, it's it's sort of like we didn't the, God didn't sort of create this beautiful form to just become a a colorless blob it, it's more for the the full expression of that realization you know that we can that that can be had the full channeling or or blossoming of the expression of god of the yeah, divine as you said it, in the, the world divine. yeah yeah we're like tools or instruments through which the divine can be um infused it's, into into the world yeah it not just can be is is is, is yeah. being played yeah perfectly you know yeah. i love that you say that it does it touches me the uh, and so that could be looked at as something no oh, yeah no this is god speaking but yeah it is it is it, and you're god speaking or goddess mm -hmm. how everyone looks at the universe itself playing itself just like this exactly nothing more nothing less than this um as Rick or as Canela or as a computer or as Skype mm -hmm. <laughs> all of this is occurring here right now beautiful well let's end on that note That's uh, we can't improve upon that that's great and uh, God in the form of our dogs are eagerly looking forward to mm -hmm. a a love a walk on this lovely day that we're having here in Iowa. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. So we'll do that. But, um, let me just make a couple of concluding remarks briefly, just um, in case somebody is tuning into th this interview for the first time. Uh, they never heard one of uh, my interviews before. Um, every week I do one, and I archive it on batgap.com, which is an acronym for Buddha at the gas pump. So if you go there, you can find them all. Uh, you can sign up for a little email newsletter to be notified when new ones are posted. You can subscribe to a podcast to get this on your iPod. Um, you can participate in a discussion group that takes place there with each interview. People chime in and start discussing points that were mentioned in the interview. And uh, sometimes they'll post a question to the guest, and I would invite you to come in and answer that if somebody posts it. Um, so there's a donation button there. If you if your don't if your finger happens to drift over in that direction, feel free to give it a click. <laughs> um, and uh, that's about it. So I've been speaking with uh, Canella Michelle Myers, um, who lives in Canada but travels around and does satsangs in different places and has all kinds of videos and so on on the internet that you can watch. And I will link to her site from BatGap.com so you can explore that and. Uh, get in touch with her if you like and uh, next week's interview if all goes as planned should be with Greg Good who's a very interesting fellow and a clear exponent of the direct path as it's called um, so thank everyone thank you all for watching and li or listening thank you Michelle it's really been I, well Canela Michelle it's yeah. been really enjoyable talking to you and uh, we'll do it again sometime thank you Rick yeah. thanks